Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We have a few housekeeping items before we start today's program. I'm Andrea Jensen. I am the Interim Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. All participants will be on mute for the webinar. We will, we will record today's webinar, and it will be posted on our website within a few days. So you can listen to it again, or please feel free to share it with your colleagues. You can go to our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and find our recorded webinars and also any of our upcoming webinars. This webinar will be about an hour and that includes time for questions. We'll take those questions at the end of the webinar, but you can put your questions in the Q&A at any time. We have someone monitoring the chat. If you have questions or if you need any help, Chris will be there to help you out. We will get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. And now we will begin. Today's webinar will discuss if there is a genetic tendency to developing allergic conditions like rhinitis, asthma, atopic dermatitis, and food allergies, or is there something in the environment that causes these? If you want to go ahead one side, there we go. Allergy and Asthma Network is a grassroots organization that was started over 35 years ago by a mom who knew that other moms like her needed resources and support. Our mission is to end the needless death and suffering due to allergies, asthma, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Today's webinar will be recorded and CEUs will be available for a minimal cost. You will receive an email within a few days after the webinar with resources about food allergies, environmental influence, and genetics. With that email, you will find a link to download your certificate for attending today. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tina Cinder. Dr. Cinder joined the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research, the SNP Center, at Stanford University in January of 2017. She's a clinical associate professor of allergy and immunology in the Department of Medicine, Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. She divides her time between research at the SNP Center and outpatient clinical care of pediatric allergy and immunology patients. Dr. Cinder completed her pediatric residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine Children's Hospital at Montfiore in Bronx, New York, and her fellowship in allergy and immunology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, known as CHOP in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is a principal investigator of several clinical trials addressing atopic conditions and is the director of clinician training at the SNP Center. Dr. Cinder is the director of oral immunotherapy clinic at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, LPCH, within the outpatient pediatric clinics. Her present interests lie primarily in food allergy and in eosinophilic esophagitis research involving strategies for prevention, diagnostics, and novel therapeutics. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Cinder. We look forward to you sharing your unique perspective in treating those with a variety of allergic conditions. Thank you so much, Andrea, for um, the kind introduction and for inviting me here today. Um, and as uh, Andrea mentioned, we're going to talk about um, food allergy and whether there is a genetic cause versus environmental and what our research shows so far. As many in the audience have heard many times now, uh, the prevalence of food allergy has been rising, not just in the United States, but across all continents. Food allergy has become a global issue. This rising burden has prompted more research into not just treatment and uh, diagnosis, but also the why. If we better understand the reasons behind increasing food allergy, perhaps we can take steps to prevent it. There are numerous factors that have been implicated to date in the development of food allergy. Most of these are environmental exposures early in childhood, sufficient levels of vitamin D, a diverse microbiota, and oral allergen exposure collectively support the development of tolerance as in not being in an allergic state. 
Conversely, allergic sensitization is promoted through cutaneous exposure, reduced diversity of the microbiome, and vitamin D deficiency. Diminished micro microbial diversity and vitamin deficiency and vitamin D deficiency are thought to interrupt the regulatory mechanisms of oral tolerance. Um, and with the latter, as in vitamin D deficiency, also contributing to decreased epidermal barrier function, that's the skin. Um, environmental exposure to peanut antigen is highly associated with the risk of clinically confirmed peanut allergy down the line. But the genesis of food allergy is a very complex process. Um, it, it, we have not yet found one thing that can cause it. Uh, there are lots of influences, which include the genes, um, the host, the individual person's immune responses, epithelial function, and environmental factors. Increased use of antibiotic use, non-vaginal births, ultra-sanitary lifestyles, less time spent outdoors, and the resulting so-called modern microbial community structures of the gut and the skin, which begins at birth, have been implicated in aberrant immune system maturation and the development of ATP, um, including food allergy. As early as 1995, the trend of increased rates in family was noted. The investigators found that allergy was more common in successive generations. Peanut allergy was reported by 0.1% of grandparents, 0.6% of aunts and uncles, 1.6% of parents, and 6.9% of siblings. The authors found that peanut allergy is more common in siblings of people with peanut allergy, and therefore there was the, the search for inheritance and the genetic contributions. In another study, the investigators looked at 75 pairs of twins where at least one twin had peanut allergy. The investigators found that identical twin, twins were nearly 10 times more likely to both have peanut allergy compared to non-identical twins. And as I have alluded to, it's not just genetics alone, but rather the interaction between existing genetics and environmental exposures. In 2021, Clark et al. conducted a nationwide survey in Canada to examine the independent effect of demographic characteristics on food allergy. They found that Canadian-born children of Southeast and East Asian immigrant parents had higher reported food allergy than children born to Canadian-born parents. This suggests an interplay between the genetic processes and environmental exposures. The authors suggested that early life environmental exposures such as climate, diet, and microbial exposure exerts a differential effect on food allergy development, possibly depending on the existing genetic background. Um, recently, I was speaking to a researcher from Australia and they have found similar findings in Australia as well, where food allergy was higher in their immigrant population um, of folks from Southeast Asian um, descent. A genetic mutation in the skin that has been well studied are filaggrin mutations. In a population-based study by Brooke et al., children carrying at least one FLG loss of function mutation were at increased risk of developing peanut allergy if they had high environmental peanut exposure in their bed dust around the time of birth. For each unit increase in peanut dust concentration during infancy, there was a six-fold increase in school-age peanut sensitization and a 3.3-fold increase in school-age peanut allergy. As we look into some of our birth cohort studies and have multi-site studies ongoing, this is one of the factors we are collecting. We're looking at environmental peanut dust in the infant's household 
as we look at long-term outcomes and whether or not they develop food allergy. And although there is a lot of evidence that there is a hereditary component to food allergy, our understanding of genetic causes for food allergy is still in its infancy. Several genes have been found to be associated with higher risk of developing food allergy, such as STAT6, CD14, FLG that I just mentioned, IL-13, and other epigenetic modifications. Um, but we need to be very careful when interpreting this information, such as these genes are associated, not causative. So this is just a signal, but not a defined, confirmed genetic link. Food allergy development is complex and is due to a combination of many different factors, genetic, epigenetic, environmental. So it's very important to continue our exploration of the process behind food allergy development. So currently, there are three known strategies of food allergy prevention that are being explored. Some birth cohort studies show that enriched infant formulas may play a role in prevention of food allergies. And this plays on existing um, signals showing that breastfed babies have a lower risk of food allergy. So they're trying to see how enriched infant formulas can provide that same protection for those who are unable to breastfeed. There is now also increasing evidence that early life allergen exposure through the skin causes food allergy, whereas early oral exposure causes tolerance. And this, this theory is known as the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. The numerous studies have, been show, have shown earlier exposure to foods considered allergenic may be protective and can reduce the risk of food allergy later in life. So as I spoke to speak to my patients in my outpatient clinic and we're discussing food allergy prevention, I talk about the six Ds. And this is diet, so early dietary diversity, dirt, so playing outside, being exposed to a plethora of um, allergens and exposures. Dogs, early life exposure to dogs have been shown to be protective. And then vitamin D, um, we, a lot of children have vitamin D deficiency because of decreased time spent outdoors. Um, so that is also something that can be protective. And then dry skin and detergents are thought to be worse for development of food allergy. So I, I will speak about dry skin shortly, um, but early dry skin and eczema can lead to increased risk of food allergy down the line. And then detergents are thought to actually break down or contribute to our epithelial barrier breakdown of the skin that can also increase the risk of allergen exposure through the skin ahead of allergen exposure through the gut. So dual allergen exposure hypothesis. So for years, it was thought that children became sensitized to food allergens by exposure through the gut via breastfeeding or early consumption. Um, however, there is now increasing evidence that early life allergen exposure through the skin causes food allergy, whereas early oral exposure causes tolerance. In the last five years, several studies have demonstrated allergen-specific oral tolerance induction to allergenic foods in high-risk children. So essentially, it's a race against time. You want to increase early oral consumption while decreasing cutaneous exposure to allergens. Increasing evidence on timing um, of the introduction of solids and development of allergic diseases have been underway. Um, we've all heard of the LEAP study published in 2015, which has led to our current um, changes in guidelines um, with early exposure to peanut. But in this study, peanut allergy was five times more likely in children who avoided peanut um, during infancy. And in the EAT study, where multiple different allergens were introduced, um, the authors demonstrated that introduction of multiple allergenic foods in the infant diet was possible 
and may be protective towards um, preventing food allergy down the line. The effect of or oral tolerance induction appears to be allergen specific. So it really are protected against the foods you are ingested and you may still have increased risk against the foods you are not ingesting. For example, in the LEAP study, early peanut consumption did not lead to prevention of tree nut or sesame seed allergy. Since food allergy develops early in life, there is a narrow window of opportunity to induce tolerance with oral introduction of multiple foods. In the health nuts, nuts population-based study in Australia, 3.1% of children already had challenge-proven peanut allergy by the time they were 12 months of age, and 9% were egg allergic. In addition, introduction of multiple allergenic foods into the diet of young infants is challenging. In the EAT study, which I alluded to, the adherence rate for introducing six allergenic foods into the diet was only 42%, meaning it was really hard to do um, for regular families. Thus, there is a need for alternative approach to prevent food allergy, not just early introduction alone. There is evidence that dietary diversity in infancy reduces food sensitization and allergic asthma, but the results for atopic dermatitis, um, eczema, and allergic rhinitis are mixed. A systematic review found that breastfeeding was protective for allergic asthma. However, the evidence for atopic dermatitis and allergic rhinitis was weaker with no effect on food allergy. Other methods such as vitamin D supplementation has produced mixed results. There is little evidence for the role of prebiotics. And while meta-analyses and two individual studies show some benefit from probiotics, these studies have um, had issues such as objective evaluation of outcomes, the design and blinding. So these studies are hard to put together in the real world. And then this brings us to the concept of atopic march. Over recent years, the focus on atopic dermatitis has increased because it is associated with an increased risk of developing food allergy, asthma, and allergic rhinitis down the line. The term atopic march is used to describe the progression from eczema to other allergic diseases. So there have been numerous studies that have shown this connection of the atopic march and development of food allergy. In the ALSPAC study, an oozing crusting skin rash was an independent risk factor for development of peanut allergy. Other studies have also shown that early onset, particularly within the first three months of life, severe atopic dermatitis markedly increased the risk of food allergy. In the Help Nut study um, from Australia, children with early onset severe atopic dermatitis had a 50% rise in challenge proven egg, peanut, or sesame seed allergy by 12 months of age. In the LEAP screening study, there was a dose dependent increase in food sensitization with increasing score ad levels. And that is a way of kind of quantifying eczema and SCORAD stands for scoring atopic dermatitis. Um, so higher rates of food allergy in those with higher SCORAD levels in children aged four to 11 months of age. Duration of infantile atopic dermatitis prior to treatment with proactive topical steroid has also been shown to increase the risk of food allergy for each month that passes where the eczema is not under control. This evidence suggests that shortening the duration of eczema by reducing inflammation reduces the opportunity for epicutaneous exposure to environmental food allergens and thereby preventing sensitization and subsequent food allergy. So in this strategy, by treating eczema early, we're blocking the way antigens can interact with our immune system through the skin. And this slide reflects the shifts in our guidelines for managing food allergy. Prior to 2015 in the US, 
the recommendation was complete avoidance of peanut and tree nut until a year of age and avoidance of seafood until three years of age as a strategy to reduce food allergy. And this was when the thought was that early introduction through the, you know, by ingestion is what is leading to the increase in food allergy. The LEAP study, which was published in 2015, showed that peanut allergy was five times more likely in children who avoided peanuts. In the EAT study published in 2016, showed that children who remained in the study and consumed the recommended amount of a variety of allergens had a 67% lower risk for developing food allergy. Based on these data, in 2017, the American Academy of Pediatrics reversed its previous guidelines and recommended early introduction of peanut protein. In 2019, the AAP issued clinical reports citing strong data for early introduction of all foods. And as we kind of ran through you know, prevention strategies and what's causing food allergies, I did want to add a patient story where they were treated for food allergies. So even if at this time, where we're still working towards effective prevention strategies, um, but treatment opportunities are also out there and being explored. Um, so one patient story I wanted to highlight um, was the story of Fisher and his family. And at six months of age, Fisher was rushed to the hospital with anaphylactic shock after eating a wheat teething biscuit. Another time he went into shock just from walking into a pizza shop where flour was in the air. Now he's 10 years old and a recent graduate of our combined food trial, which combines multiple food allergen oral immunotherapy with biologics on board. And after um, completing the trial, he wrote to us saying, because of this trial, I feel like a totally different person. He can now eat small portions of multiple foods he was allergic to, no more canceled play dates because the other parents were too nervous to host Fisher, no more missed opportunities to vacation in remote locations because they were too far from the hospital, no more constant anxiety around food. This trial improved the lives of everyone in our family, says Fisher's mom, Nan. Um, she said at first she was scared to have Fisher eat small amounts of the foods she had worked so hard to keep from him, but she was quickly reassured. What makes the program so special is not only the wealth of knowledge from the staff, but the breadth of resources available. These include fully equipped hospital rooms, a psychologist, and innovative technologies, such as a food challenge virtual reality headset. All of these greatly increase the patient experience and increase the chance of success in the program. Now Fisher is looking forward to eating an English muffin and going fishing for crabs and shrimp, foods he couldn't even touch before. To the center staff, he says, thank you so much. I just have to say thank you. You've changed my life. Now I'm not isolated. I'm not anxious. Just thank you. And I, I wanted to highlight this case mostly to show that food allergy impacts not just the individual, but their family. And apart from the dangers of an allergic reaction, increased mortality and morbidity, it also plays a big impact on quality of life. So as we look into new treatment um, opportunities, we, we strongly highlight the shared decision-making and kind of eliciting what the concerns of in patients and their families are and really meeting them where they need it most. So I think that is um, the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And I don't know, Andrea, if you wanted to take over. Hi there, Dr. Cinder. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, well, apparently my headphones decided to quit working. So, okay, I <laughs> will get close to the mic so everyone can hear. So I think this was a great presentation because this, um, gives a lot of um, 
a lot of hope to families. There can be a lot of concerns. In, in my family, we all have allergies and asthma, and that was our biggest concern, that was it us being genetically defective and, and passing things on to our children. But I uh, was struck by the slide you had that talked about the environmental exposures, um, especially in Canada. So I think that's important for people to understand it. Um, for those that may have missed that at the beginning, do you mind just going over that just a little bit more so people understand it's not all genetics, it can be environmental as well? Sure, absolutely. Let's see. Sorry to make you. Oh, no worries, no worries at all. Were you thinking of this slide or this um, one? You, you talked about in Canada, the. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Yeah. And that was probably back at the beginning. I apologize we're, for all of you that are joining us. We're going a little bit backwards now. Um, but really, yes, this is a slide. And I think this is really mm -hmm. important to talk about that um, it's not just genetics, which was my fear when I was having kids 31 years ago. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for bringing this up, um, Andrea. Right. Based on these findings, the authors actually suggested that it wasn't just genetics, it's early life environmental exposures, such as climate, diet, microbial exposure, um, and kind of this overlay on the existing genetic background that may increase the risk. Wonderful, wonderful. And another question we had is someone asked, um, so when you talk about early introduction, what exactly mm -hmm. is the age window? So yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead. That's a that's a fantastic question. And, uh, you know, before I trained in allergy immunology, I um, trained in pediatrics. And we, we say early and the guidelines are four to six months. But what I tell families is some infants just show readiness right at an earlier age and some a little later. So I know this you know, is it's hard to follow these guidelines, but I, I really urge my family is to kind of read your baby's cues. And if they look like they want to try foods and they want to take a lick, um, go ahead and start introducing a variety of foods. And, you know, with the studies, there was a focus on specific allergens, the high allergenic foods. But really what the data is suggesting is dietary diversity. So as many different things as you can have your infant try, it's all going towards an improved microbial diversity and decreasing long-term food allergy risk. I think that's an important point and I'm glad that you reinforced that again. So many of us, when, when I was having children was taught, don't feed them anything, only breastfeed and then only give them rice cereal at about six months. And now that's completely been flipped on its head and a completely opposite. And it can take a while for people to make that shift, especially if there's someone my age that might be having grandchildren and which I'm not. Um, but for a lot of people to make that switch and say, well, this is how I raise my children. And so I'm glad to see so many um, school nurses on the line that can help us kind of get that word out. Um, so we have some in the chat. We also have some questions. Someone asked, and let's leave it right here on this slide. They did want you to review the six D's for food allergy prevention. Um, and they also ask, are there any home remedies that are helpful? Oh, yes. Um, so I, I, I preemptively ended up on the six D slide here. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the six D's that I, it's, this is my mnemonic for remembering, is diet. So dietary diversity early in life, low in processed foods and sugars, um, dirt. I, in my mind, like to combine the dirt and vitamin D together, just thinking of it as increased time spent outdoors. Um, and, you know, just keeping in mind that when we're saying dirt, we're not, we don't mean like unhygienic or filth, right? There, there is a difference. Um, so just kind of being outdoors and being exposed to different kinds of um, environmental exposures. Dogs, um, early children with dogs in the home, and we think this is because the dog goes outside and brings in different um, antigens on, in, on its feet and fur is what may be providing that benefit. Um, cats, on the other hand, can kind of increase risk of asthma um, early, early on. And then dry skin. Um, a lot of our current research is kind of, 
you know, showing that minimizing dry skin and aggressive treatment of eczema um, may become protective against developing food allergy. Um, so just kind of moisturizing with thick, unscented creams um, can really help. And then detergents. What we found is, you know, what makes some popular detergents so effective is, you know, they have these proteases in them that break down the protein of the dirt that's on the clothes. But these proteases can also break down our own kind of skin barrier um, as well as mucosal, right? Because if you're smelling the detergent, that fragrance, um, you are ingesting some of that and it's going through your mucosal um, layers through your nose. And that may also be contributing to um, food allergy development. So um, what, I, what I recommend to my families is um, doing, you know, an extra rinse in the washer and, um, you know, minimizing fabric softeners and things like that. And um, a couple brands that are kind of touted to be more um, uh, better for sensitive skin um, and are unscented may also be beneficial in terms of um, food allergy development down the line. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we did have a question on the chat and I, I believe she just answered that. So perfect timing once again. Um, and I do like how you mentioned doing an extra rinse cycle. And then our family, we're always very careful to make sure that any um, detergents we use are unscented and it makes a mm -hmm. big difference um, since we have eczema and all those other fun things. Um, another question we have is, does mom breastfeeding and eating these allergens, does that help expose the baby? Yes, yes, we we highly encourage diverse diet in mother as well. In our Sunbeam trial, where we're actually enrolling pregnant moms and then following the uh, child after birth for three years of age, um, we are collecting all this information. We are uh, trying to understand what the mom's diet is during pregnancy, um, what the diet is during breastfeeding, um, and the baby's uh, diet as they're getting older and older. We're also trying to collect stool samples to better understand microbiome and how they, that may be playing a role, um, not just from the stool, but also in the skin. So um, currently the guidance is that, yes, definitely have a diverse diet, um, but at the same time, even though the data is promising, it hasn't shown a huge kind of you know, sign pointing to food allergy prevention. So there's more to this. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> Understand. Yes. And and this is part of the important work that you do is, is research. And, and we know that things are changing all the time. So um, another question we have in the chat is, could you discuss the protocol you use to introduce eggs? There's a lot of information about peanuts, but what about eggs? Yes. Um, one of the reasons peanut allergy is studied so much, even though, you know, there are many other allergens, is because peanut is, is one of the few among and tree nuts that kind of persist long term, whereas egg and dairy children, 80% of children outgrow it um, before three years of age. Um, so that's part of the reason a lot of studies don't follow egg and milk allergy, because it's hard to tease out what's just natural um, naturally developing tolerance versus um, the intervention making a difference. Um, that being said, um, even though peanut is the best studied and um, in the eat trial, egg and dairy were also introduced and was found to be protective as well. So I, I think of it as um, whatever the family's diet is, just slowly incorporating those um, foods into the baby's diet that's, you know, choking proof and um, easy to consume for the baby, but not really withholding any of these so-called highly allergenic foods. Wonderful, wonderful. And I know just a little bit follow up when you talk about um, not giving them foods they could potentially choke on. We had a photo of the little baby in the high chair and he was having those little puffs and, and a lot of people aren't really familiar with those. Yes, perfect right there. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. We don't normally say brand names, but you could just explain a little bit more what that is. Sure. 
Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. So in the UK leave trial, um, Gideon Lack, um, he's actually one of our collaborators for one of the food allergy prevention studies we're actively doing right now. Um, but what he noticed is that babies in the UK were had a high rate of peanut allergy, whereas, you know, in Israel, um, peanut allergy was much, much lower. So he kind of looked at what they were doing, what were the Israeli babies doing, and found that a very common early childhood snack is something called bamba. And it's basically a puff, um, kind of like the puffs we have in the US um, in little shapes. It, it's the same concept, but it's made of peanut. And babies were ingesting these as early as four, five, six months. Um, and incorporating it into their diet, and they had lower risk of developing food peanut allergy down the line. So in the LEAP trial, that's exactly what the researchers did. Um, they looked at babies that were sensitized, meaning that their skin prick testing was mildly positive, as well as blood work showing that they were already on the path for potentially developing peanut allergy. And in one group, they fed the baby's bamba and the other group, they did standard of care, which was avoidance. And they found that the babies who ingested bamba um, were five times more likely uh, to not develop food allergies. So, or five times less likely rather. Um, so bamba after that study has become very popular and is available on Amazon. Um, so that is a great way of introduction. Another thing that, you know, I used to do with my children was I would just, as I was making purees, I would just put in all the nuts in the puree into applesauce um, so that they could ingest it that way as well. Excellent. Excellent. I, I love those examples. And that will help some of the families out there that are curious a little bit about that. Um, someone asked, and we and, and hang on tight because we have a lot of questions in the chat. So someone's asking, why would cats cause an increased risk? It, um, risk of asthma. Um, we see that a lot. Something about the cat um, dander is considered to be high risk for developing asthma and difficult to manage asthma. Um, the, the risk is not so tied with food allergy per se. Um, and again, these are all associations, not ca causations. For instance, if I have a child who has no eczema, has no asthma, I am not worried about the cat in their household. I'm only concerned if their eczema is becoming harder to manage and control and their asthma flares are um, difficult to manage with you know, high potency um, inhalers and they're still requiring multiple courses of steroids. So these are all, again, just kind of um, additions to an existing kind of um, predisposition the child has. So I don't, I don't want you to think that if you have a cat, you must remove the cat to prevent food allergy. It's only in those considered high risk and are already kind of suffering from cat allergy. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we know that cat dander is a lot stickier than dog dander as well. So oh, yes, it stays in the household for years, even after removal of the cat. Right, right. And that could yeah, make the difference. So um, we had someone that was interested in the work that you're doing and wondering if there is a chance to have a child engage in some sort of research program. Are there places around the country that are doing this? They're asking if there's anything in Portland, Oregon, but are there other places in the country that are doing research such as yours? Yes, yes. So our, um, for instance, the SEAL trial, where we're enrolling infants up to four, uh, three months of age, who have already developed either dry skin or eczema. And in the study, in one group, we're aggressively treating with one kind of moisturizer, another group, a different kind of moisturizer, and a third group, standard of care, to see, you know, we think that early moisturization can kind of reduce the risk of food allergy, but unless we can show that to be true, we can't really make that recommendation for everyone. Um, so for the SEALS trial, we're working with our colleagues at the University of Chicago and National Jewish Hospital um, in Denver. We just um, enrolled a site in Cincinnati and we're working um, with our colleagues in the United Kingdom, Dr. Gideon Lack's team as well. And one way to look up kind of studies around you is going on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and basically any clinical trial that's 
um, occurring have to be registered on that website. And you can put in different kind of search terms and look for studies um, around you and near you. Thank you. And, and that's a great information to know that this is a way that we can pay it forward. So um, not only can it help our children or grandchildren, but a way that we can pay it forward for others, you know, down the road that are following in our footsteps. So um, someone asked, can a child outgrow a food allergy? Yes, they can. And that is actually one of the research questions we are asking. How, because when we test an infant, a baby, um, you know, and they are allergic, some of them naturally outgrow their food allergy. And what is it about their immune system that allows for that to happen? Um, so we are trying to look at those who naturally outgrow their food allergy and those who didn't and see what is going on in their immune system so we can un better understand. And by better understanding, we can help with the, you know, the guidance we give, right? Like, so if our testing shows that you are more likely to naturally outgrow, um, we will say stay put and keep checking in and we can keep testing. Whereas if our testing shows that you are not likely to outgrow, then we might recommend, you know, embarking on oral immunotherapy earlier than we normally would. And also if we can identify those who do naturally outgrow, that can potentially help us with new treatment strategies for um, more kind of individual-based care. Excellent, excellent. And, and a follow-up would be a little bit on the flip side of this. We know that um, people can develop food allergies at any time, even as an adult. That's right. And we are actually seeing that more and more um, where adults, we used to think of food allergy as a childhood problem and not something that you would see in adulthood except for shellfish, which um, seem to occur out of the blue for adults. And we are, we are looking into that and have a um, shrimp allergy study kind of um, in the works for adults. Um, but we are seeing that not just, not just shrimp, but other foods as well, more and more adults are developing we call it de novo food allergy, where they didn't have a problem with it as a child. Um, so through these research trials where we are, you know, collecting blood, we are trying to understand, you know, the immune responses, um, not just the IgE and the B cells, but also the T cells and all these interactions that are occurring in our immune system to see if we can better understand what is it that's contributing to this and what can we do about it? That That's brilliant. And there's so many things to look at. I really thank you for all of your research and for helping people because there's so much out there and there's so many tiny little details. Um, so we have another question and um, this one's actually about milk. So um, is milk one we want to wait until the child is about 12 months or can that be introduced sooner? Yeah, I would say go ahead and introduce sooner in the form of yogurt, right? But, um, because we've actually found that yogurt, um, because of its um, kind of the microbial properties and um, it's considered a probiotic or some or even prebiotic. So it would be great to introduce yogurt um, early on. Okay. Um, we've had a few questions, people just wondering about how does what mom eat how is that related to when she's expecting and how that will affect the baby? So they're just wondering about if mom eats certain allergens, will that help expose the baby? Or, or another question asks, is there a chance of that that um, child can develop a food allergy for something that the mom ate while she was allergic to a certain food? Yeah, no, the, these are such excellent questions. And there are more unknowns in this than, than what we already know. Um, so part of the Sunbeam trial, we are also... Um, collecting some breast milk as well to understand how mom's diet, like by the time it gets to the infant, what does the antigen look like? Like what is the antigenic load? So far, the data hints towards uh, diversity of diet and mom to be protective um, and does not hurt. Um, and, you know, if mom is allergic, the child has an increased risk of food allergy. Um, but this is a really I, I guess what you're hearing is we, we don't know all those nuances. All we can say is, um, you know, dietary diversity is helpful. And, um, and then 
because there is a chance of a genetic predisposition for food allergy, you can sometimes do everything right and by the book, and we still end up with um, allergy. So um, don't, don't give up hope, and then we will continue to kind of look and explore and ask these questions. And these questions are great because it kind of helps us design our next studies and what the, you know, where our information is still lacking. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate you saying that because oftentimes there can be so much mom guilt. You know, was it something that the mom did while she was expecting or, or early on in life? And so, um, like you said, they can do everything right. And it can still, kids can develop allergies and asthma and food allergies. That's that's the luck of the draw sometimes. Um, a, another question we have is for kids that suffer from atopic dermatitis without food allergies, what are the chances that they can develop a food allergy later on in life, even elementary or middle school? Oh, yes. So that is a great question. I would say that if a child has atopic dermatitis early, um, if they're actively eating the foods, I am less worried. Um, but if they are, they have eczema, in my mind, that child is always atopic, meaning if for whatever reason, I were to withhold that allergen for a prolonged period of time, there is a chance that they will develop a food allergy. So what I would recommend for, you know, families with children with eczema is making sure that all these foods are always in the diet. And before embarking on any type of elimination diet to really working with your allergist and doing set testing to see if there are sensitizations. And when I say sensitization, that means that if you do the blood work or skin prick testing, it shows that you are um, sensitized or quote unquote allergic. But if you're consuming the food, you are still keeping that clinical reactivity at bay. So if I have a child whose testing is positive, and but they're tolerating the food, I am very aggressive with my recommendation to make sure that food remains in the diet. And if we have to do an elimination diet for another condition, for let's say I have lots of patients with um, eosinophilic esophagitis and we are pursuing an elimination diet, then um, we do talk about the risk of developing food allergy by um, kind of eliminating that food for a while. Okay, excellent, excellent information. Um, someone asks that um, they say, I have several people in my family with a soft shellfish allergy, such as shrimp, crab, et cetera, um, developed later in life. Is this common for a yeah. seafood allergy? Also, is there a way to get more information about the research study about shrimp that you mentioned? Oh, yes. Um, so shrimp was actually one of the, you know, in earlier on, early 20, 2000s, we used to think that shrimp allergy, seafood shellfish allergy is kind of the only one that presents in adults. It was um, quite, you know, as far as adult food allergy goes, the most common where someone can be totally fine with it um, while growing up and then develop it out of the blue as an adult. Um, and some of the research studies exploring this is trying to look at just that, like those who had lifelong allergy versus those who developed this um, down the line. Um, in terms of current existing food allergy studies, so we just wrapped up our motif study. Um, and this was a diagnosis-based study, kind of trying to explore different diagnostic strategies for those who responded really well to treatment with trip allergy with oral immunotherapy. And then in terms of upcoming trials, Baylor, um, Dr. Carla Davis is putting a grant together, and then Stanford will be one of the sites, as well as a few other sites in the country, um, looking at treatment of shrimp allergy in adults with a biologic known as omalizumab on board. So it's not active yet, but if you <clears throat> look on clinicaltrials.gov, it's a great way to kind of explore studies in your area, and you can put in search terms for exactly what you're looking for. Thank you. That, that's great information. And, and some people in the um, chat have wondered, is that something that's covered by insurance um, being part of a clinical trial? Yes. So clinical trials actually do not um, use insurance. And usually, the, because this is a trial, there is a 
you know, there is some studies will have something called blinding, which means you don't know what treatment you're receiving and your provider does not know what treatment you're receiving just so we can have an unbiased outcome when we're looking at the results. Um, but the majority of clinical trials, in fact, I, I don't know of any that go through insurance and all the care through these trials are free of care. Uh, sorry, free of charge. So no um, kind of financial, um, um, there are no financial kind of obligations uh, from the participant standpoint. Right. And, and I think that's good information for people that maybe have not been part of a study before and may not understand that this is this is a little bit different. It doesn't go through insur insurance completely separate. Funding is separate. And so there will not be a charge, um, but there will be a benefit of helping those around them with being part of a study. So one question we have, and thank you for being so patient answering so many of these. I don't think we'll get to every single one, but I will try. Um, someone says that they ate peanut butter all the time as a child, and now as an adult, they're allergic. So any explanation for how that happens? Yeah, and it depends on kind of what their symptoms are. Um, for instance, you know, could be that when they were, and I'm going to speak in kind of generalizations because I, I don't know um the person's specific clinical history but what could have happened um it two things so one thing could be that they were sensitized meaning they always had the um, specific ige antibodies that recognized peanut and by keeping peanut in the diet they kind of subdued those allergic cells and maybe there was a period of time when peanut was no longer in the diet and that kind of prolonged elimination, either knowingly or unknowingly, may have kind of skewed the skills, so to speak, and putting them into the more allergic um, outcome, clinical outcome. Um, the other thing that could happen, and we see this a lot, is something called oral food allergy syndrome or um, pollen food allergy syndrome, where if someone has pretty strong environmental allergies, um, when they eat specific foods, they can cross-react with um, the pollen allergens. And so we do see this in some of our um, very, um, those with hay fever and seasonal um, pollen allergies, where peanuts can induce kind of an oral itching, but it will, it will not kind of progress to a life-threatening allergic reaction. And that's where kind of working with an allergist to do the testing um, kind of identifying which kind it would be. One thing, one thing that helps us do this is um, we have something called component testing, um, which any allergist can actually do in the lab, um, just order the blood. Um, it looks at specific um, epitopes or kind of markers in the peanut. And then some of those markers are more um, correlated with true allergic kind of anaphylactic type symptoms, whereas some of those epitopes are more associated with the oral food allergy syndrome. So based on those labs, um, I might recommend, you know, in my clinic, maybe doing an oral food challenge just to be sure. Um, and it would help us tease out if it's a true allergy, meaning that that can, you know, progress to an allergic reaction in anaphylaxis versus oral food allergy syndrome, where you can pre-dose with an antihistamine and kind of keep the symptoms at bay. And I think that's an important distinction. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you spoke about that. I'm having an oral food um, challenge next week. And so it is hard to tell, is it really an allergy or it, it, is it something else? So actually to do that food challenge is a really important part of, of what you do and, and all the allergists. So thank you for talking about that. Um, someone is asking lots of questions about allergies and some of these allergic <laughs> connections. So can someone outgrow an animal dander allergy? Oh, we have not seen folks outgrow animal dander allergy. Um, what we have seen is, um, you know, when we think about the atopic march, we see eczema kind of starts off early, then we see asthma um, and food allergy kind of go hand in hand, and then allergic rhinitis or kind of environmental allergies develop later and are a little more persistent. What we have seen, kind of like the whole concept of allergy shots and oral immunotherapy, repeated exposure to a specific animal may reduce the symptoms in certain folks, um, but based on our current testing strategies, it's hard to predict. 
Okay. And for those who may not be as familiar with immunotherapy or allergy shots, I mean, my kids did those for five years, so I know them very well. <laughs> but for those that under, don't understand a little bit of the concept behind it, would you have time just to explain that briefly? Sure, absolutely. Um, so with allergy shots, or um, as we call it, subcutaneous immunotherapy, we basically try to identify what your environmental triggers are. Um, it could be grass, it could be dust mite, um, animal dander, cat, dog, mold, um, different kind of trees. And then we basically put together a vial that contains extracts of all of those um, triggers. And then we do shots, we inject them, we build it up over time. So we, with each shot, you kind of go up just a little bit and just a little bit. So you're basically training your immune system um, with gradually increasing dosing um, to basically ignore that allergen if it does come across it. Okay. Well, yeah. So after five years, we hope that, you know, environmental triggers will no longer um, be bothersome because your immune system now knows to recognize it and ignore it. And, and, and that's what generally happens. That's what happened to my children. The allergies are still there, um, but they can go to a friend's house that has cats or dogs and not mm -hmm. have a severe asthma mm -hmm. attack. So thank you for explaining that. So, oh, yes, this goes on. Um, this question, it has a little bit to do with what you talked about, the oral um, Sorry, just lost the word. I've got long COVID brain. Oh, Sorry, no oral immunotherapy. <laughs> that, that brain fog that we all have. I'm just going to read the question. Um, I'm allergic to cherries, I, an adult allergy. However, when I eat them raw, I have symptoms, but not if they're cooked or canned. Yes. I have the same thing with peaches. What is That's the difference right. between raw and cooked? Yes, yes, yes. This is a perfect example of oral allergy syn syndrome, where basically in the uncooked, and it should be the skin of the fruit that can trigger, it cross reacts with your existing environmental pollen allergy. So as you're eating it, your mouth seems to think that you're ingesting the pollen protein and triggers a mild, it should be mild, um, itching and kind of sometimes, you know, a little bit of throat itching and mouth itching, lip itching, um, that should generally not progress to an allergic, more severe reaction. And what happens is when you cook it, you change the protein component, you denature it by the high heat, and that takes away that cross reactivity. So your body no longer sees it and thinks that it is the pollen that it's ingesting. So in other words, you're saying for people, since it's Valentine's Day, they can go have a cherry pie or a peach pie, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, if it's baked, then it won't, you know, some of our patients, let's say they love carrots, but if they eat raw carrots, um, it triggers oral itching. One of the things they sometimes do is they will actually boil it ahead of time, but they like eating it cold and then they'll keep it in the fridge and then kind of munch on it later. But it's the raw fruit and veggies with the skin on that can often trigger these symptoms. And by cooking and kind of removing the skin can sometimes minimize those symptoms. And that is a brilliant tip. And this is the first time I've heard this so that you can actually cook that, let it cool, and mm -hmm. then eat it a little bit later when you want it cold. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, so this is last question I think we have time for. Um, someone asked, will cooking tree nuts in foods is it the same thing as cooking with fruits? Oh, in terms of do you denature the protein? So mm -hmm. there have actually been studies looking at boiled peanut and roasted peanut, um, and it doesn't seem to play a big role, meaning if you are allergic, um, you can still have a reaction to it. Um, and same with the oral allergy syndrome, for those who are having that kind of um, cross reactivity, we haven't, because the prenup protein is, it, it's not as susceptible to kind of changing its shape when cooked, um, folks can continue to have symptoms. Okay. Okay. And, and Dr. Sindhu, do you mind going just down to the very last slide? And, and we could be here all day, but I know that you need to get back to your patients. Um if you if you're able to yes so we have um, speaking of long COVID as I mentioned that many of us uh, have that and have brain fog and all sorts of other fun little little side effects but we will have a webinar and this will be on March 9th and it's called long COVID how does it impact asthma and asthma control so thank you Dr. Cinder I 
can listen to you countless times and still learn something from you every time. So thank you. And for everyone that joined us, if you'd like to go back and listen to some of the questions and answers and the entire presentation, this will be recorded. This will be on our web website within a few days. So you can listen to that again. For those of you that want CE credits, um, that will be available as well. So thank you a million times, Dr. Cinder. I, when I grow up, I want to be smart like you and have a brain oh like gosh. you. So. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, Andrea, for the very kind words and for inviting me. Uh, really, thank you so much. And this has been such a help to everyone. So thank you. Please feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues because we need to get this information out to more people. And thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Have a great day. Bye.